This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. The following is being brought to you by remote transcription from a college classroom where I'm teaching in a course on world religions. Religion, through its millennia of world history, has shown a vitality, a robustness, which indicates that there is somehow a quest for spiritual reality at the heart and soul of every human being. People very simply will not live without religion. In some form or another, it appears that there's a hungering of heart and a searching of spirit. Like salt in the soul, people thirst for spiritual things. Quest for God. One thing it is to believe in God, another thing to know God. So first of all, it means not just an intellectual assent to the concept that somewhere there is an oblong blur in the universe whom one might call God, a sort of metaphysical oatmeal, an amorphous something or other out there, but that it is possible to experience and that indeed one engages in the experience of the finding of God. It is possible to measure incrementally, historically, that time and time again when there have been these resurgences of faith, new visions of what the world is and what God is and what our purpose is and who we are, why we're here, where we came from, where we're going, there has been advance time after time, incrementally, point by point, bit by bit. The religion of the future is going to consist of a hybridization, a bringing together of religious concepts, truths, ideas, and ideals from many different sources, Eastern and Western, and that these are not mutually contradictory at many points, but are in fact in spiritual unanimity. Reevaluating, discarding that which was previous past superstition, anti scientific viewpoints, anti intellectualism, anti philosophic viewpoints. Lives, minds, emotions, spirits are stirred by some supreme call, some glimpse of that which is eternally real. There's a coal of fire on one's tongue. One has to talk about it. One becomes a transformed person and then engages in the process of transforming the world. And this is not superficial symptomatology. This is not a palliative. This deals with the fundamental problems of the planet. Underneath every social problem, whether it be divorce or warfare or hostility between institutions, there lies the hostility of individual human beings toward other human beings. And if it's possible to change that, then the world itself markedly and in incredible ways will become different. So that when a great spiritual teacher is able to say, love your enemies, on a person-to-person -person level, he's speaking, in fact, of the ultimate solution to that for which we create war maps and have on the 6 o'clock news stories of carnage and international bloodshed. Because finally, if it's possible to change human motivations, the world itself ultimately will change. This is the fundamental concept which we believe at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute. I'll get into some more specifics in a moment. But the changed people can and will create a changed world. Someone then may ask, Specifically, what does this mean for me? We're talking about history, cultural movements, how institutions change. What does it mean to the individual? It means coming to terms with the highest spiritual teachings one can find anywhere and everywhere. And I emphasize the quest for spiritual truths anywhere and everywhere. Jesus of Nazareth himself said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Truth. The questing for that which is real, the rejection of that which is unreal. This is fundamentally the religious and philosophic quest, the quest for the real. Synthesis, a new age of understanding of religion based on a harmony of science, philosophy, and religion. That these are not contradictory, but indeed they're unified. The new age is going to consist of people who are invigorated, who are enthralled with the process of worship, in the midst of work, that one's entire labor, one's entire life is glory to God, is joy to God. Someone may object, how can I be important in this spiritual renaissance? I'm not a great speaker or writer or poet or philosopher or theologian. The important thing is that a person, where he or she is, where you are, college students in this case, be committed 
to being used in the highest possible way for the highest possible truth. The forest would be quite still if no birds sang but those that sang the best. Each person has some contribution to make. The religion of the future, in my view, is going to be a series of great truths, supernal ideas, seven major ones I'm going to list. First, the fatherhood of God. Jesus, for example, in the New Testament refers to God a total of 152 times as a father. Not merely as my father, but your father. Again, traditional Christianity, in my conviction, has narrowed and parochialized Jesus' great universal concept of God as father of all people, creator, father, sustainer of all. Second, corollary truth, brotherhood of man. There is no sexist intention in using fatherhood and brotherhood. It simply is a concession to the historic fact that these were the terms he used. But what these symbolize have to do with the role of all of us, men and women, as children of God, as related in one spiritual family. In Matthew 23, 8, Jesus says, you are all brothers. And he says again in Matthew 23, one is your father, which is in heaven. The concept of the entire planet is a family. One objects, perhaps, that everybody's not living that way. Well, maybe it's because everybody hasn't heard it yet. I'll get to that. Third, the kingdom of God is within. That's Luke 17, 21, for those of you shuffling through your text. God has given something of himself to indwell the mortal mind, that we're not somehow abandoned, but God is here, near, close. Fourth, the concept of the will of God, which means that God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for individual lives that it's not all a vast cosmic accident, but that there's a purpose being worked out. There's a reason, there's a direction. It's not a captionless cartoon, but we're here for a purpose. We can find it. God has a plan, and that that becomes the supreme exhilaration of life. Fifth, the concept of eternal life as an option. Jesus says to the woman at the well in Sychar, Spiritual truth is a well of living water welling up into eternal life, everlasting life. This is a great theme in the teachings of Jesus and in many other world religions as well. Sixth, the quest for values. Jesus says, for instance, blessed are you who hunger and thirst after righteousness, which is also translated in the J.B. Phillips and the revised versions as goodness. The yearning for values, truth and beauty and goodness. And then, as the Greeks will want to extend the list to justice and love in its different definitions. But the quest for that which is valuable and that which is real. And finally, seventh, perfection. Jesus said, be you therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. All creation seems to yearn for betterment. And in my view, these seven points, the fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, the kingdom of God within, the concept of the will of God, eternal life, the quest after values, and the quest for perfection, are cardinal points which, interestingly enough, in talking with Hindus and Mohammedans and people of many different religious orientations globally, I find that in most of those doctrines there is some counterpart or, in some cases, complete assent, yes, that these are largely, widely acceptable as fundamental truths, fundamental understandings. From the ancient Assyrians, humankind learned the building of libraries and postal systems. From the Babylonians, we learned a knowledge of astronomy, the molding of clay bricks, such technology as that. From the Egyptians, we learned surveying. From the Persians, we learned the entire concept of international coinage, our monetary system. From the Phoenicians, we learned an alphabet. From 
the ancient Greeks. We learned really of music, drama, architecture, philosophy as they have influenced Western world. From the Romans we learned the making of bridges, roads, laws. But for all that we have learned scientifically, philosophically, technologically, we have not yet learned what the great spiritual teachers taught, what Jesus of Nazareth and the other teachers taught about love for God and love for people and peace on earth and goodwill among men. And until we learn those things, until we come to grips with and master and assimilate those teachings, everything else we've learned about bridges and roads and laws and architecture and sculpture and all the rest of this is going to matter relatively little because we continue to tear it down by fighting by bloodshed, by, as it has been described, man's inhumanity to man. What shall it profit us to build the Sphinx in the Egyptian desert only to have the armies of Napoleon shelling it and during World War II, again, shelling it, using it for target practice. That's why it doesn't have a nose. As a matter of fact, something of a similar nature was done to the Acropolis area of Greece. We build our architecture, we erect our statuary and our aesthetic endeavors only to have them torn down time and again by inhumanity, by hatred, hostility. It is an easy solution to set about changing the world by saying we're going to manipulate structures, we're going to change institutions, we're going to vote in new legislation, which has its place. All of this is legitimate. But if it doesn't touch where people live and think and breathe and their motivations and aspirations, then of what profit is it? And it is at this point that the planet needs a new birth, a new age, a spiritual renaissance. Only transformed men and women can create a transformed world. Only better individuals can fashion a better society. Only advanced citizens can architect an advanced civilization. That a new age on Earth, in all our cultural institutions, depends first on people who have been transformed, who have been spiritually remotivated, renovated. People who will say, my family is not just my blood family. It's larger than that. I'm not merely a citizen of my town, my county, my state, and my nation. But my family is humankind from sea to sea. The entire planet, one family of God. That will be at the heart of the religious consciousness of the future. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.